Hello, everyone, and welcome to Call Your Hits, a Storm Riders Airsoft podcast. Thanks for joining us, everyone. In today's episode, we are going to be closing out our discussion on tips for beginners. If you recall, so far, we talked about sort of the beginner mindset, how to select, you know, your proper gun. And we spent a little bit of time also talking about gear. But today, we're really going to dive into how to select the right tactical gear, you know, the gear you're really going to play airsoft in. One small caveat, and we're not going to really talk about this because we've talked about it a lot in the past, but it is iPro. Uh, We're not forgetting about it. We've just addressed it many times before. It absolutely is worth the money to invest in a good set of iPro that will last you for many years and, you know, adequately protect your eyes. We've said it a hundred times. You only have one set of eyes, so spend the money that you need to make sure that they're kept safe. And that's just as much as we're going to say about that today. Really, our topic of choice today is tactical gear, iPro uh, iPro aside. So there's a couple of different things that we really wanted to address in sort of this area. So the first one is this notion that a lot of players have that real steel gear is always better than reproduction gear for as far as airsoft is concerned. And players need to spend as much money as they can to make sure they get the real steel gear, you know. Go out there and get, you know, a cry multicam BDU because any repro is just garbage, you know. Um, Go out there and spend all the money you can to make sure you get a real steel plate carrier because anything else is garbage. It's that got to spend $1,000 on your soft gear or your gear is not good enough mentality. Yeah, exactly. it's really not a productive one in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. But on the flip side of that, there is gear that is worth spending good money on, right? And making sure that when possible, you buy the real deal instead of reproductions. And as a beginner, it can be really hard to know how to invest your money, especially because we know as airsofters that airsoft reproduction gear is very inexpensive. And by contrast, a lot of real steel, real brand gear is very expensive. So you have the choice between buying a $20 mag pouch and an $80 mag pouch. And they both look the same. So one is literally four times the cost, right? You can get a off-brand multicam BDU for like, let's say $100, or you can go and buy a cry one for like four or $500. So how do you know what is makes the most sense to spend your money on, right? And that's a challenge. Now, for some people, money is not an object and, you know, that's fine. That's not really what we're talking about here is if you're the kind of consumer who wants to be consci- conscientious about how they spend their money, or maybe you don't have tons of money to throw around, that's fine too. How are you going to invest your money? And we really want you to be careful here because a lot of people, um, you know, honestly, including in some ways, I think our past selves will give you lists and lists of just like, oh, you need to buy this reel because otherwise what you're getting is complete garbage. And um, the the internet Airsoft community is very, very opinionated about this, but not always in ways that are helpful or that make sense. Yeah, absolutely. And the reality is that one size doesn't really always fit all. You could get a reproduction of an item and it's great, but you just got really lucky because their quality control is kind of garbage and you got a good one, but most people get a lemon and that's the reviews that you see online. So you got to take that with a grain of salt. Obviously, if you have a piece of kit that's reproduction, but it works for you and it's cheap, but it works for you, then that's great. That's not taking, the fact that people don't like it is not taking anything away from the benefit it's bringing you. So you can certainly take that with with a grain of salt, but these are sort of more generic concepts that you should apply. Yeah, absolutely. We're more trying to create a, a tool set to help you be a smart shopper than a list of gear you should go and buy. Totally. Um, you know, I mean, if you want a list of gear we feel that you shouldn't go and buy, you can come talk to us on the Discord and we'll uh, yeah. we'll happily give you all the lists you can uh, ever need. But that's not sort of the intent today. No, definitely not. <laughs> so starting out, I mean, one of the things that we've often said that players need basically right out the gate uh, is good quality footwear. And so if you are a brand new airsofter and all you have is your airsoft gun, one high cap mag, a bag of ammo, and a, a, you're obviously your good eye pro and like a battery, that's all you have. What is the next thing that you should look at getting? Well, if you don't already have quality footwear, that should definitely be the next thing on your list. Absolutely. I mean, we talked last episode about the fact that like airsoft guns aren't manufactured to the same standards as real steel. Right. And in particular, I feel like mentioning the durability thing again 
is valuable here, right? Uh, if you fall face first because of your uh, terrible boots and you just snap your barrel off, you're going to have a really sad day. Uh, and likewise, you know, if you roll your ankle, break your ankle because you're wearing terrible boots to airsoft, you're, again, you're going to regret it, right? And like we've all seen those guys who show up and play in like skate shoes. Um, and it's not really a good idea. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of things to consider about the airsoft field in general. Most of the time, it's not flat, even terrain like a tennis court or whatever, right? Like it's it's probably like rocky or muddy or, you know, sandy. Uh, it's uneven. There's generally going to be like debris around. Overall, it is not the kind of place where you're just going to get solid, even footing all the time. And so as a consequence of that, it generally is advisable to have a pair of footwear that provides support for your ankle because your you, last thing you want to do is roll your ankle. We've seen it at Airsoft hundreds of times where people either roll their ankle. I've done it myself and it's not bad. You just sort of roll it. You're like, oh God, owie. Okay, fine. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, you're okay. Two, you know, an intermediate, like you roll it and then maybe you sprain it and you have to, you know, take the, the rest of the day off. Two, and I've seen this myself and I think Pat was there for that time too. Some guy just literally just snapped his ankle like clean and broke it. And then they had to get a paramedic and stuff. And that's just, you know, as they say, no bueno, right? You don't want to do that. And I firmly believe that if that individual had been wearing like a full ankle support boot, it would have been much less likely for them to injure themselves in that way. No, 100%. And, you know, we've also, you know, we've seen a lot of the, like the rolled ankle and the rolled ankle and I can't really walk, but like, it's just a mild sprain, you know, and I've had to, had to hike out from a field carrying other people's gear in an effort to make sure that they were okay, you know, because they couldn't even really support their own weight. Right. Um, and it's, it's all a very, a silly thing to me because a good set of boots that will protect your ankle and that have good grip on, you know, as many sort of surfaces as possible will run you money, but they're not going to wear out playing yourself. You know, I've worn out exactly zero pairs of boots playing yourself, right? Um, which is not to say that the, my old set of, my oldest set of boots aren't uh, well worn in at this point, but uh, they've still got some go left in them, right? You just, don't do that much hiking and running around uh, in an airsoft season. Yeah, or, or, or even just like a regular pair of footwear. Like, think about it. You know, let's say you're an absolute mad lad and you play every weekend. That means you're wearing your boots for airsoft 52 times a year. So if you compare that to your daily wear shoes, that's nothing. Yeah, like that's, that is 20% of the time you spend in whatever you wear to work every day. Exactly. So that being said, so when you're looking at your your airsoft where you're like, obviously, I'm not going to go in my flats, right? I'm not going to wear my <laughs> deck shoes out to the game. I'm not going to wear my tennis shoes if I can avoid it. I'm going to try and get a pair of decent like footwear. Don't wear your Doc Martens to airsoft, kids. <laughs> yeah, or your Blundstones. Please leave them home. Um, <laughs> so just like everything in airsoft, we go, okay, well, what are we going to buy for airsoft? We play soldiers. So what do soldiers wear? Well, soldiers wear combat boots. So I'm going to buy combat boots. That is the natural reflex for like 90% plus of airsofters. It was my natural reflex. It was Pat's natural reflex. It was a natural reflex of basically everybody I know who plays airsoft. Because you look at soldiers and you go, that's what they wear. If it's good enough for them to go and fight in a war zone in, it's definitely good enough for me to play airsoft in. And as a non-trivial perk uh, for that particular avenue, right? Like when you start looking into it, you realize, man, I can get like you know, lightly used secondhand combat boots for 20 bucks, mm -hmm. um, you know, and don't get us wrong that $20 pair of combats that, you know, Phil bought when he started and that I bought when I started, uh, they did stand us in decent stead, um, you know, f in terms of value for money. Um, and they're certainly better than like wearing your sneakers, right? Don't wear your running shoes to airsoft, you know, your $20 pair of combat boots is not a great pair of shoes really. But like, it's better than having no ankle support. I will give it that much. And so, I, I mean, it's worth noting, like what we were saying, like if it's good enough for soldiers to fight in, you know, in like the deserts of Afghanistan or wherever, um, then it's good enough for us to play airsoft. But the thing is, is it good enough for soldiers to fight in? Like, I mean, if you look at a lot of military units and you look at, um, you know, uh, content creators on like YouTube and stuff like Flannel Daddy, some of his early content was about how to select footwear and in particular he would say you know if your unit will allow you use a civilian shoe don't use a military shoe 
I mean, it's uh, it's the oldest story, right? It's uh, what is everything for the military made by? The lowest bidder. That's right? right, yeah. You know, the combat boots that the U.S. military and the Canadian military send, you know, soldiers out to fight in, uh, and every other military in the world, really, are not made, you know, to the absolute best, most exacting standards available. They're made to the best, most exacting standards available for $5. Yeah, and that they can get, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 of them, like, made basically immediately or whatever. Yeah, exactly, right? We need a whole lot of these as cheaply as possible delivered by next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they're uh, they're made with really good cardboard, right? <laughs> like, yeah. And, I mean, all joking aside, some of them, some, some of the military ones are made, especially more modern ones, are definitely better than just cardboard, right? You look at some of the Canadian Forces ones in particular that I've used, they're not, like great but they're also not like rubbish right they're 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 perfectly average <laughs> perfectly mediocre i mean yeah but the my, my point is sort of like the ones that you're gonna get secondhand yes in, you know, agree the army surplus like they're there because they're worn out right they're yeah. there because they were disposable and they have been disposed of mm -hmm. and so like you can definitely coax you know a season out of a pair of those and a pair of dr shoals uh and yeah. you know make it work um, but we're trying to talk to you about like planning your gear. Yes. As a new player, but like in a, you know, where should I be after a season? If I want to keep doing this kind of way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the reality is that like a pair of civilian hikers will run you like pretty decent ones will run you, you know, 200 Canadian. You can definitely spend more. Um, you can get really, really nice hiking boots, but like a $200 pair of hiking boots that fit you well. Um, and if you're playing in an environment like the one we play in our, you know, Gore-Tex lines, they're waterproof, definitely a, a perk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so $200, right? Buy them before you buy your BDU. Buy them before you buy a vest, honestly. Um, you know, you will have a lot more fun playing if your feet are comfortable. You'll have a lot more fun playing if you're not hurting just punishingly because you've been walking around in worn out boots for three or four hours or five hours. Yeah. And... Um, the hikers will give you a more comfortable um, ride, for want of a better way to put it, right? They'll give you a more comfortable thing to stick your foot into. Uh, and they'll also give you better traction uh, for the same and the same ankle support. Uh, and they'll last you forever. Yeah. And like, you know, if this is your second Airsoft game and you are not looking to spend a whole lot of money, uh, if you're able to get a, a pair of surplus boots, then totally, totally cool. Like Pat was saying, like you can go spend 20 bucks and you'll be all set. But once you're starting to look at like, I need to put a bit more money into my boots, um, you will start to see other types of combat boots that are available out there. For example, I wear Magnums, right? I have like Desert Magnum, um, forget what the, the actual model is. You can also get like SWATs and you can get a bunch of like 511 tactical boots and all this kind of stuff. I've got a pair of uh, Black Hawk Desert Ops. They work great. They're really comfortable. Yeah. And they're, the thing about it is though, is that my Magnums were like close on $200 anyway. So for a yep. little bit of extra money, I could have got a pair of Salomon Hikers and they would have been way better. Now I still have the the Magnums and I'm going to use them until they're until I'm done with them, but like if I had my time back and my money back, I would I would not buy those uh, SWATs. I would get a pair of Salomon hiking boots because they are just a better shoe overall. They're a better shoe for airsoft for all the same reasons that Pat was listing earlier. Um, and ultimately, you know, if I am going for the look or whatever. Well, you got lots of special ops guys who are using exactly that kind of footwear. So I'm not looking out of place by just wearing a civilian shoe as long as it's, you know, subdued colors and not like blaze orange or whatever. But like most hikers are tend to be like just brown, which is fine. The reality is, you know, like I have a pair of good, you know, uh, combat boots. I uh, have used them for years. They're great. Um I also have a pair of good hiking boots. The hiking boots are flat out better. They are better after a year and a half of being worn hiking and uh, honestly as my winter boots because they're Gore-Tex lined and that makes them fabulous. Uh, they're in better shape than my uh, combats. They're more comfortable than my combats ever were. They keep my feet warm and dry. And like, I mean, if you've been paying attention, you know, someone out there is going... You live in Newfoundland, where it's, like, cold and wet all the time. Why in the name of God do you have desert combat boots? Uh, and the answer is because they matched my multicam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? 
I have worn those in, you know, February here in like minus 20 uh, and played. And that was a terrible decision. Um, and like, I don't think that I regret buying them. Uh, I think they've, you know, been very good boots. They've been good to me. They, uh, they don't owe me anything. Yeah. Uh, but the hikers are uh, definitely, definitely the better pair of footwear to pull out of the closet, put on and go play airsoft in. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think they're always going to be at this point, you know, I'm, uh, I'm more likely to buy another pair of them uh, when I wear out either them or the combat boots than mm-hmm. I am to buy another pair of combat <laughs> boots. One last point about footwear is that, and we haven't really touched on this yet, but we're going to repro footwear. There is absolutely a market out there with reproduction footwear. So you can find ta- boots that look like tactical boots, like military tack boots or special ops boots or whatever, but they're reproduction. So you can find a boot that looks like a 511 boot, but it's $50, $60. Or you can find a boot that looks like a Magnum and it's you know 50 or $60. As a rule, we would highly advise you against buying Reaper footwear. There's a number of reasons why here. Number one is the build construction is just not there. So again, we talked about how you don't use your your footwear, your airsoft footwear, a whole lot every year. You know, you might use it at the absolute maximum. You're probably using it, let's say, 50 times in a year uh, for several hours at a time. Repro footwear, let's say it has really crappy glue in the sole. You could break it in two days. And then you're out $50 and you need to go spend some more money to buy another pair of footwear. That's best case scenario. They just break. Worst case scenario, something happens to you on your field and you actually injure yourself as a result. And it's just not worth it. Your feet will not thank you. Your wallet will not thank you because you will have to buy it again. So it's just a waste of money. And we would highly, highly advise against buying reproduction footwear. Just save up a little bit more money. Spend the extra to get a good set of hiking civilian hikers. That will be your best bet uh, for to keep you playing airsoft in the same pair of shoes for the next, you know, 10 years. And like you want your boots to provide you with, you know, comfort and with ankle support and, you know, with support for the rest of your feet. Uh, And if you're buying $50 knockoff footwear that came out of, you know, uh, a factory and God knows where, you're not getting it, right? You're you're lining up to actually injure yourself. um, And that's just a poor decision, right? Um, You know, the sole might fall off, but the sole might fall off when you're running, right? It might fall off when you need it to really, uh, to grip something and you can hurt yourself. Don't Mm -hmm. do it. It's just a mistake. And that's not to say that that can't happen with real branded footwear, but it is highly, highly unlikely because quality control is just, you know, quality control at Merrill or at Salomon or any of these other companies is pretty much rock solid. So you're not going to have a pair that fails compared to um, if you buy a repro, which is much, much more likely to have a critical failure, right? So overall, we would advise against buying repro footwear and we would encourage you to buy uh, the real deal. Absolutely. Now, when it comes to a piece of gear that is absolutely worthwhile to buy repro, uh, we would suggest helmets. So helmets are a really big look cool factor for Airsoft. There's obviously you can get all kinds of different helmets. Uh, I wore, and I know Pat did for a while, we wore like skate helmets because we did the Black Hawk Down kind of vibe. Uh, you know, the 1990s called they want our helmet back kind of deal. <laughs> <laughs> now, like everyone and their dog, and sometimes quite literally their dog is wearing a fast helmet, and you can get all kinds of different like um, makes and models and shapes and cuts. Uh, and that's not to make mention of you know like uh, historical helmets as well as you know uh, different country helmets like you know the CF Galley helmet uh, or what you can get in Europe and all this kind of stuff. So helmets look cool factor. You can get real helmets. You can buy real helmets. Uh, they tend to be extremely expensive, especially if you want one that is ballistic rated. But our question would be, why do you want one of those for Airsoft? Kevlar's really cool, folks, but like you, uh, it's a bit redundant for Airsoft, right? Yeah. Like I wore a real Kevlar helmet for that I had as a surplus that I, and I wore it for years and it was heavy and it was not particularly comfortable and I had really good pads in it. And still I was not like super jazzed about it. Hell, it's great if real things are being shot at you and exploding near you, right? Like <laughs> right? all over it. But again, we're, we're playing airsoft and, um, you know, as with sort of the, 
the ammunition load and, you know, talking about like mags and stuff, right? Uh, your real world soldier who's rocking an M4 would absolutely kill to be able to carry the number of bullets we carry uh, in BBs, right? Um, at the same way, like if they could be equally combat effective, that would be humongously good for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, if they could carry a helmet that would stop a bullet that weighed what a plastic reproduction helmet from China weighs, yeah, again, absolutely, right? The reality is that that's not a feasible option, but uh, there's no reason to go, oh man, you know, like real soldiers wear this, you know, heavy Kevlar helmet, so I'm gonna? Totally. Um, and, you know, the thing about it is, especially when it comes to airsoft replicas in, in terms of helmets, there's just like everything airsoft replica, the quality and build varies widely, but you can absolutely get a decent build replica of a fast helmet that even has the adjustment knob on the back to make sure that it's nice and tight on your head. And that's what I use. I know that's what Chris uses. And it ran me maybe like $80 Canadian. Prior to that, I had a really cheap one that wasn't adjustable and it really sucked. Like it did not fit on my head very well. So I would recommend if you're looking at getting a fast helmet, Spend that like 80-ish dollars to get a fast helmet that ha that is adjustable on the back and has pads that, on the inside that you can kind of move around with a bit of Velcro. And that's a really good investment. It will stay tight on your head. You can use it to mount your GoPro and whatever cool guy accessories you want to run on there. And it will do what that type of helmet is supposed to do, which is provide you a little bit of bump protection. Now, uh, real talk with Pat for a second here. For those of us who are uh, shopping in the large and ogre size sections at uh, your local store, please bear in mind that almost all airsoft repros you'll ever see of helmets are made in China, and they are made to uh, Asian sizing, uh, which means that for those of you who have a gigantic skull, like myself, uh, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. You can buy as many of them as you want. You can buy extra, 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 extra large, and it'll... It's just, it's just a no-go, um, unfortunately. Like, part of the reason I have the skate helmet is that I can actually buy a skate helmet made to, you know, fit on my giant skull. Um, yeah. But in fairness, there's also a reason that mostly if you look at our uh, team photos and stuff, you'll see me wearing a boonie. Um, yeah. They're comfortable, they keep the sun off my head, and I can get one that fits me. Yeah. So, you know, sorry to those of you who are also on the larger uh, scale, but uh, you're sort of at the real or bust and uh, a real fast helmet last I checked costs enough money that I'm uh, I'm right out. <laughs> yeah, totally. So if you're a beginner and people are telling you, oh, don't waste your money on a repro, you got to spend $300, $400, $500 on a real deal helmet, otherwise it's not worth it. That is complete nonsense. You can go and you can spend $80 to $100 on a perfectly good replica adjustable helmet, unlike, uh, assuming it'll fit you, like Pat, which Pat was just saying, assuming you have a, you know, relatively normal sized head you can get one that will fit you you totally. don't need to go spend the money on the real deal however i just want to note so it absolutely will provide you as bump protection right and that's pretty much it you know if you run into a room and there's something that's low hanging and you bang your head off it you'll you'll be fine etc but it's still not a real helmet in the sense that you know the department of transportation or something will tell you that it's okay to wear if you're looking for real protection you should be getting something like a skate helmet skate helmets are meant to be worn and meant to protect your noggin from like taking a fall and cranking your head off the sidewalk and those will protect you against that a, a replica airsoft helmet no guarantees um, but for our purposes, are totally fine. A quick caveat here, you can also get repro fast helmets that have this like plastic visor that comes down uh, that serves as eye protection. Um, we would highly advise against that. Now, firstly, most of those don't have the adjustable knob on the back anyway, so we wouldn't recommend you go for it if that's what you're looking for. Um, but even more so, don't trust your eyes to a flimsy piece of plastic that slides down. Uh, also, it's garbage in terms of fogging and stuff, so just don't. Don't bother and it, and with it, that stuff. It's not NC rated plastic either. Like no matter what they say for your $40, you're not getting NC rated plastic there. Yeah. Uh, we have had people buy them and show up and be like, hey man, I'm going to use this as my iPro. And it's like, well, I'm going to shoot it at like point blank range with my rifle and see what happens before you do that if it's cool. And people are generally like, yeah, sure, it'll do nothing. And I've had it punched straight through. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah like, totally. And that's no bueno. Bottom line there, like if you're, if you're a beginner and you're like, okay, I think I want to get a helmet, cool. 
um, spend, you know, the $80 to get a good quality replica that's adjustable that you'll be able to, to wear. Uh, I recommend a fast helmet. You can spray it. You can get lots of different covers for it and it looks great. If you're not into the fast helmet vibe, there's a lot of other, you know, rep model replicas that you can get out there from, you know, World War II lids, Pasquette lids. You can, uh, you know, the whole, the whole shebang, right? As long as they're adjustable, uh, we think you'll be well served. I personally like the fast helmet a lot compared to all the other helmets that I've used. And I've used several different ones, uh, because it allows me to still wear my comms gear. No problem. It also allows me to go prone and not have my head bumping or my helmet bumping the back of my neck, not being able to tilt my head up all the way. It's just a really convenient, uh, build for a helmet and it's got a mount for a GoPro that I'll take just about, you know, um, you can get mounts for it on Amazon. It's super cheap, very, very effective. I recognize that they're not that cool because everybody's got them, um, but they work really well for me and they've also got rails. So like I'm getting very shortly a set of Earmore uh, comms gear that I'll be able to mount directly on the rail. Super sweet deal. Uh, so if that's a, a, a way that you're looking for, if you spend that $80, you can make sure that you get something that will work with all of that stuff. So something to consider. Sorry. And if you're going, oh, you know, like everyone's got them. Well, yeah, everyone's got them, but like everyone's using them because they're comfortable, right? It's not just that they're widely available. Like, you know, realistically, if you want to, you can probably get like, you know, a horned Wagner-esque Viking helmet to wear to airsoft that will serve the same functions as a Reaper airsoft helmet will in terms of, you know, oh, if I bang my head on something, it won't hurt but it's it's not going to be practical, right? Yeah. So we talked a little bit about gear that you absolutely shouldn't buy Repro. We've talked about gear that is absolutely, you should buy Repro for airsoft purposes. Um, obviously, it goes without saying that if you're looking at this for real world applications, just what are you doing listening to this podcast, right? <laughs> so <laughs> now let's talk about this area that's a bit of a gray area, and that is your load-bearing equipment, right? So that's either your chest rig, or your plate carrier, uh, your you know your belt potentially, any other stuff that you use to carry like your mags and you know your first aid kit, your sidearm, your snacks, <laughs> like so any of that before, stuff. Before we go there, or I guess on the way there, I want to pause briefly to mention uh, slings. Right? Oh yes, sure. Slings are totally a place where you know you want to actually buy a real one. Um, yep. Predominantly because like you can get a real steel sling for 50, 60 cad. Um, we have ones that we prefer, um, but ultimately your gun is probably the most expensive part of your kit, uh, unless you're into World War II uh, gear. I've recently discovered how much World War II boots cost, um, and they're they're pushing the, the gun on the most expensive part of that particular kit. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, or for those of you who are like, oh yeah, well, I bought thermals. Yeah, good for you, rich man, good for you. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, uh, you don't want to drop your gun, right? If you let your gun go, you want to be absolutely sure it's going to go where it's supposed to from a gameplay, you know, being able to get it back into your hands every time from the same place point of view. But the, the biggest thing for me is I want to be absolutely sure that this gun that I've, you know, tuned up, that I've teched, that I've worked on, all of this, uh, when I let go of it, I do not want it to hit the ground. <laughs> yeah. Right? That is a huge feels bad. And like I've used cheap, not very good quality slings and had them snap and gone, oh my God, I'm glad I caught that. And I've seen people use them and have them snap and not catch them. Yeah. Right. And like, you know, you get repro slings and you're like, oh man, it looks exactly like a real steel one. Uh, and that's totally true until it snaps and you realize that the, uh, the metal fixtures that are actually gripping and holding onto your airsoft gun are made out of pot metal. Um, yeah. right. And have, have nothing in common with steel um, whatsoever, right? Let alone and, tempered steel, right? Like, yeah, absolutely. You know, and like, so I rock a uh, a Fair Concept Slingster. Uh, it's uh, one of the older models with the metal furniture. Uh, it was originally designed to be able to be used um, with anything from like an M two four nine to an assault rifle, right? It will never ever break under the load an airsoft gun puts on it. Uh, I've run a, uh, a Mark 46 on it and like it was almost comfortable and that thing was, as Phil will attest, extremely heavy. <laughs> yeah, totally. And you're not the only one who runs a Slingster. I mean, I run one, Chris runs one, Cal run, runs one. Um, they're an excellent piece of kit and it gives me the confidence, just like it does you and all the other guys, that if we release our rifle for whatever reason, 
the rifle is going to stay where it's supposed to be. It's not going to hit the deck or anything like that. Um, you know, so if you're looking at a rifle sling, which is absolutely a piece that you should be considering um, for more than just tr sidearm transitions, we use slings all the time as a sort of an aim assist. Like it's just a useful piece of kit. Uh, if you're a beginner looking for a sling, make sure you spend the money to get a good quality real steel sling. You don't have to buy a slingster. You can use a single point and you can get some uh, relatively inexpensive single point slings that are not going to break, nor are they going to break the bank. I think our previous slings that we were using were Spec Ops Lone Star slings that were like $40. Not very they, expensive. They were great. But they were great. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, they, the buckle never broke. Um, I... I roughed housed the crap out of my rifle and that sling. Never had yeah, any issue I, with it. I, I know for a fact that Phil slammed a car door on it a couple of times, right? Yeah. Just on just on the buckle, and it just went, yeah, whatever, right? yeah. and kept working. Um, and I used that sling, the exact same one, from 2009 to 2020. And never had an issue with it. It never broke. It never failed in any way, shape, or form, despite me rolling down a cliff and losing my sidearm in the process and all this kind of stuff. But hey, rifle was fine. Have I um, mentioned that Phil is hard on his gear? <laughs> yeah, and it was it was perfectly dandy, right? And I'm just going to note with the with the slingster, uh, just because my perspective on it is uh, a little different from Phil's. So for a really long time, my rifle was uh, tuned in such a way that it just was not good for shooting while I was close to people. And so I wanted to be able to tow, zip it in really tight to my body and switch to my sidearm when I was going into any kind of situation where it wouldn't be reasonable to shoot someone with a rifle. Uh, and having used cheap slings, they won't do that. Right? They're just not made to the same tolerances. They will not allow you to tie the gun down in exactly the way you want it to, exactly where you want it to every single time. And that is critical if you're trying to transition between uh, weapons for some sort of practical purpose in gameplay. Right, Like if you're switching to your sidearm because you know, you, you're having fun doing so, or you're switching to your sidearm because you've run out of ammo and it's quicker, it probably isn't actually, but we can talk about that some other time, that's fine. If you're switching because you have to, it's really, really helpful to have a good sling that works right, uh, and in the case of the slingster, that is really well designed. Yeah, totally. So, if you're, again, to, to come back to the theme of the episode, if you're a beginner, and all you've got is your gun, a high cap, ammo, batteries, and your iPro, you're looking at footwear first. Second thing you should probably look at is a sling, right? Oh, some way to keep your to keep your gun on your person, uh, and help you aim and be a bit more effective on the field. That being said, that's not necessarily a fun thing when you're looking at all these different plate carriers and chest rigs and all this kind of stuff, right? So, yeah, naturally, your good sling is not going to make you feel like a badass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And a lot of players naturally gravitate to some sort of load bearing equipment, right? So, what should be what you should. So what should you be looking for, and is it worthwhile getting real steel, or can you can you uh, buy repro and be just as well? So I want to start off by saying that I myself have never ever owned a real steel plate carrier in my life. All this time playing Airsoft, I have only ever used replica plate carriers. That being said, they were on the higher end of replicas, so it was brands like Fly or Pantac, which turned into Phantom. Those are pretty good brands, and I'm not getting a plate carrier for $20 or $30. You, you know, it's more in the like $80 price point. And the reason why that makes a difference is because for me in particular, for the longest time, I ran a plate carrier with training plates that were weighted. So I wanted to make sure that I had something that had decent construction with decent stitching and so on to make sure that, you know, my plates, plates weren't going to fall out. But it was still a replica. Because... There really is no need for us in Airsoft to go out and buy a three or four hundred dollars or more plate carrier, right? Or chest rig. The reality is that, well, we're not carrying, we're not inserting Kevlar and we're not inserting real plates and our lives are not going to depend on this plate carrier. So investing that kind of money, you're just not going to get the return for Airsoft versus. If you want it to look cool, that's fine. But a lot of these replicas look almost identical to the real deal. So people generally won't be able to tell the difference. Right. Yeah. So I mean, the first uh, the first um, plate carrier I used, I was going to say the first vest, but I did have one of those terrible black cross draw uh, fixed, you know, M4 vests. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first 
tact you know the first like decent thing I used of that was a uh, was a fly sirens, um, and it was indestructible. It's still in use here. Uh, it was purchased in yeah, like two thousand eight, two thousand nine, uh, and uh, you know it. The guy who owns it still wears it regularly. It's still in perfect shape. Um, it has been gamed, you know, a ton. It has been dragged through the woods, tossed down hills. It has had every manner of abuse that you could reasonably consider heaping on a heaped on it, and a few that you wouldn't reasonably <laughs> consider. Uh, and it's still great, right? It still looks basically brand new because it's designed to hold up without failing like the real thing is designed to hold up without failing under combat conditions and the repro one is like eh, you know slightly worse but not significantly um i wouldn't want to put kevlar in it i wouldn't want to put plates in it uh, mm -hmm. i don't think it would hold up to that super well um the the quality of stitching on it is not superlative but like it's great for airsoft um it yeah. was definitely on the higher end of the available uh Cyrez at the time and I, I don't regret getting rid of it, but it's that's not because it was bad. It's because I didn't want a Cyrus. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and I, yeah, I have no regrets about that piece of kit. Uh, I do run uh, a real steel piece of uh, load bearing equipment. My chest rig is is real. Um, but it's uh, it's real largely because um, Karu had one and I tried it and fell in love and I could afford it. Um and if you're going like, oh man, you know, should I buy one? I mean, it is fantastic. You know, I'm I'm all about it. But you don't need to at all. Yeah, and the other thing too is, you know, part of the reason why you bought that is because it comes in size ogre, right? Totally. You can can you get a replica that is sized for a you know five foot six regular person? You know, who is not, you know, smashing through the countryside with his broadsword? Uh, probably, right? So, and it would serve you probably just as well. Because the actual uh, the actual piece of equipment is coming with just molly and you're slapping the pouches that you want on it, right? Which yeah, totally. is something that you should be looking for, especially as a beginner. Uh, if you're buying a piece of... Uh, load bearing equipment you should be looking for something that has molly on it so you can customize it rather than something that is fixed you can get and i have two of these actually because of some error but i have two 40 re repro like uh haley strategic kind of looking thing like chest rigs but i can't move any other pouches around so for me that's kind of garbage but it was a proof of concept i invested the money because i wanted to see if i like chest rigs i do and so i'm going to be looking for again like either a repro or a you know a, a a decently inexpensive real steel chest rig that i can slap the the pouches i want on right and and at the end of the day um, I don't genuinely think there's going to be any difference really in comfort level between what Phil ends up rocking and what I'm rocking. Yeah. Right. Uh, I've got a, um, a fair concepts FPC. Uh, I really like it. It's the gen one version. Um, and I went out of my way to get the gen one version for reasons that we can talk about at some point on a podcast episode. If you guys tell us you're interested, but, um, you know, I, I don't ever plan on replacing it, right? It is super comfortable. It does 110% of everything I will ever want it to. Um, it's very modular, but like, I didn't need to spend that money on it. I wanted to, so I did. Yeah, there's a lot of good repro brands there when it comes to your load bearing equipment. Uh, and we would highly recommend getting, you know, the good quality repros uh, rather than getting the real steel whenever you can, just because it's cheaper and the quality for our airsoft reps is, is perfectly fine. However, there are pieces that you are going to want to buy real, uh, like real steel or, you know, branded as much as you can. And in Absolutely. general, this will involve any sort of um, equipment or gear that has elastic built into it. Uh, so, for example, we use Ferro Concept elastic cummerbunds on our plate carriers um, because they're super, super comfortable and way better than side panels. We use Blue Force Gear triple 10 speed pouches for our mags because they lay flat when you take the mag out, which makes it lower profile. That's great as well. When you buy Repro, most of those have really cheap elastic. And if after a very short amount of time, that elastic will deform and will no longer do the thing that it's supposed to do, right? In the case of the triple 10 speeds, it won't lay flat anymore. It'll just be like an open pouch. Uh, and, and you uh, lose in, retention there too, right? Like it, it just totally. becomes loose and floppy. It's no good. And same thing with your plate carrier, right? If you're using like replica, like elastic cummerbunds or whatever, it's just going to get floppy and you don't want that. So 
you want to make sure that you buy real steel uh, branded whenever you can. The same thing goes for HSGI tacos. Uh, the taco pouches that have the bungee cords and stuff like that, they have amazing retention. But if you get knockoffs, and there's tons of knockoffs out there, generally speaking, you'll find that after, you know, a season or so, they're just, they're garbage. Now, the, the real ones, the branded ones, are more expensive. There's no, no doubt about it, right? but you get much better quality, it will serve you a lot better in the long term. You're gonna have them for a much longer period of time. And that's really important. It's a it's a buy once, cry once kind of thing, right? Yeah. Uh, and like, realistically, if you look at it the way I do, um, you know, those 10 speeds or the taco pouches, whatever you prefer, uh, the real ones, you won't lose your mags, right? And so, yes, they're gonna cost you about twice as much as the repro ones, but you won't have to buy a new one next season and you'll still have the mags you put in it at the end of the day, right? You're not going to have to go look for your stuff or just yeah. have lost mags and that is great, right? You know, I mean, yes, mags are consumable to some extent for Airsoft, but like if you're buying 20 or $30 Airsoft mags, you don't want to lose them. Even if you're buying $10 ones, like it adds up really quickly. Yeah. And so like, you know, when it comes to your pouches for just random stuff like your admin pouch or maybe a pouch to put a first aid kit in or pouch to put your snacks or your map or you know whatever larp item that you're carrying with you on the field that day you can just use whatever pouches right you can use repro pouches those are all fine basically you're talking about cordura and a zipper like it's it's not rocket appliances like you can get that figured out and it's it doesn't have to be very expensive but when it comes to the retention that you need for your mags if you're running around and your mags are flying out of your pouches that sucks, right? I am going to throw out there that um, one of the things in Phil's list just now I actually do disagree with a little bit. I think it is worth your while to buy a real um, first aid kit pouch. Um, not necessarily even a mil-spec one, although, hey, like, great. Um, but you want that particular piece of gear to be placed so it's easily accessible. And uh, real ones again have that oh yeah the elastic in this actually works it actually holds the stuff i've put in it in place as i move around you know not that it usually comes up but like if you're actually first aid certified and you're actually planning on uh you know dealing with little injuries that pop up at airsoft and they do right like all the time uh it's worth having a real one because it'll cost you 20 bucks instead of 10 and it will make your life better if you ever actually need to use it totally legit i uh, I, i'll take that so you're a beginner, you've bought your gun, you've bought your iPro, you've bought really decent footwear, you've bought uh, a decent helmet, if that's what you're looking for, or some sort of thing to put on your head, you know, boonie hat, uh, baseball cap, that's fine too, I rock one for years, whatever, but if you got a helmet, you got a decent repro, you didn't break the bank on it, but it's it's helping keep your head, uh, you know, nice and, nice and squared away, you can rock your GoPro if you've got one, you can mount some scrim on it so you can blend in and look like a bush, whatever. It keeps your brains in for when you bash them off of something like a dumbass. <laughs> you've also bought a sling for your rifle, right? You've uh, you've managed to assuage the desire to get a, a cool guy piece of kit and instead you've you've got a, you know, a real steel sling for your rifle, so congrats. Uh, or you failed and you've went straight for the load-bearing equipment, which is also fine, and so you've you decided to uh, get yourself like a decent uh, reproduction, either... Um, chest rig or a plate carrier you've got some decent quality mag pouches if you need them uh, if you're still rocking a high cap you probably don't need it right now um, but then you can consider getting some some mid caps or, or what have you but then one of the other pieces that we haven't addressed is your clothing right your bdu um what are you gonna what are you gonna wear and i think it's worth noting here like just just like right off the the starting point with this you know we did a camo video um last summer and uh, one of the things we tested was just like your your olive drab, and it works surprisingly well. Totally, so, like, you don't need to burn a ton of money on this. Yeah, um, you, you can. Like this is definitely an area of uh, of your kit where like you can spend as much money as you want. Yeah, and there's a lot of like fashion camo out there in terms of camos that see particular vogues. I mean, for a while it was like Cryptek Highlander, or Cryptek Mandrake. You can't see him, but Phil is hugging his Alpenflage right now. I mean, yeah, that's that's a, that's a vibe. But then you've also got other camos. Like, I mean, when we started, you know, Storm Riders multicam was in vogue. It was huge. Uh, Woodland came in vogue. You know, there, there's you can you can very easily like multicam black. Like, there's a lot of like really 
uh, fancy camos that people tend to gravitate towards. And that's all fine. If, you know, we've said before, Airsoft is a fashion show. If there's a particular camo that you that you like, you can certainly go for it. That being said, like Patrick just said, you can get a lot of olive drab and you, you could get it at like basically any army surplus because olive drab has been in use since like World War II. And as a consequence of that, there's a huge volume and you can get yourself a pair of pants and a jacket um, that will run you like 20 or $30, right? It's not very expensive and it's perfectly gameable. And it's right? comfortable. You know, totally. Like they're, they're good, solid pieces of gear um, and yeah, cheap as chips. Yeah. So when it comes to the question of like, should you buy genuine or can you buy reproduction uh, BDU? Well, sure, you can. There's a lot of like reproduction BDUs out there, but like, my question would be, why would you want to do that? Because a good quality repro BDU is not much cheaper than some of the brands that exist out there that are real brands. And in particular, you think about like Shadow Tactical, you think about TruSpec or Proper. These are brands that you can get a BDU for like, you know, $150, let's say, for top and bottom. Maybe a little bit more than that. You might just have to break the bank and go to 200 But if you want a good quality repro, it's still going to run you like $120, $130. And I can basically guarantee you that the stitching will not be as nice as a real, uh, like a real brand. The quality control will not be as good. And in many cases, the actual camouflage itself will not be as good of quality as you will get in a real brand. So it won't, it won't stand up to being washed as easily. And so suddenly you're you know, nice and green replica vegetato or whatever is now faded as crap because you've put it through the wash cycle a few times, right? And that sucks. Turns out your faded multicam, while it doesn't look a whole lot worse for photos, works a whole lot less effectively at concealing you. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, you know, one of the things that we uh, we like about, like, the woodland stuff is you can get surplus woodland pretty easily for yep. not very much money, right? Um, and it works. It works really well in the environment we play in. So mm. that's, you know, a big part of why we use it. And if you're uh, lucky enough to live in Europe, you can find surplus DPM. You can find surplus Flectarn, uh, both of which are incredibly good camouflages. Uh, Flectarn in particular, if you watched our, our camo video, it's awesome, right? It's man. awesome in, in, in North America. It's awesome in Europe. It's just a really good camouflage. There's other patterns as well. Like, I mean, if you uh, look at um, the Nordic countries and like, you know, Finland or Scandinavia, uh, there's a lot of different uh, camos that are available at their surplus stores that are perfectly perfectly decent so if you're just starting out and you're looking at camo we would this is what i did this is what pat did this is what basically everybody does is you hit the surplus store you see what's available out there and don't be discouraged by olive drab it's a perfectly decent camo to use you put your plate carrier your chest rig on top of that and then you're good to go the other thing that you can do as well if you're looking for a cheap option you can paint your cat your bdus there's no reason you can't take a rattle can and put some more brown on there or put some more black on there what do you think real soldiers do right? Yeah. Like if they have gear that doesn't match the particular environment that they're in, they spray it. That's it. You know, they hit, uh, like they hit their chest rig with a bit of Krylon, they hit their boots, whatever, to make it blend in a little bit more. And there's no reason you can't do the same either. Absolutely. Uh, one caveat about the, um, repro BDUs also, that's really, I think we're throwing out here is again, you know, for the, for the other ogres in our, uh, viewership, they are made in Asia. They are made in Asian sizes, so yep. like your uh, extra large pant in uh, in Japanese men's sizes uh, will probably fit Phil, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. right? Like, so you definitely want to think twice before you order sight unseen from like eBay or AliExpress or wherever a set of repro BDUs, uh, because they're often not going to come in a size that even works, and then you're just out money. So like on the whole. I think this is a, a really good support your local surplus store uh, moment for most people, right? Uh, you don't need, like, brand new multicam. I mean, if you want it, I'm not going to stop you from getting it. I wore it. It's cool. Love it, right? Uh, and I'm pretty sure my multicam BDU is actually real. But, like, at the same time, it's expensive. And if you're a beginner, there's better stuff to spend your money on. Uh, especially early, right? Like a good sling and a pair of olive drab BDUs will cost you way less than even a, a crummy sling and a pair of real BDUs. Yeah. 
And especially if you're looking at those, like, tactical, again, like, you know, the cry BDUs and stuff with, like, integrated knee pads and all this kind of stuff. All those features are great, but the reality is that they are very, very expensive. And really, the only thing you're going to be doing with that is flexing on people who can't afford it. Because it's not providing you any measurable benefit that any other BDU is going to give you. And if you just slap a pair of knee pads on there, right? In many cases, you know, you buy once, you cry once. Um, but you don't have to do that with BDUs, right? Like you can get perfectly serviceable stuff for not very expensive. Absolutely. When it comes to beginners, like we've we've gone through the sort of our logical order, right? That being said, you're going to want camo probably sooner rather than later because it does give you an edge on the field. Um, so when you're sort of deciding where you want to, you know, initially spend spend your money. So yeah, you make sure you have your rifle and stuff all squared away. Get yourself a cheap set of BDUs. Get yourself some good footwear. You'll be set for a while, right? Absolutely. If if you want a helmet, that's like we said, that's fine. But you know, you get a sling for your rifle. That's that's going to be pretty helpful for you. But the last thing we want to leave you with is don't let people either bully you or pressure you into spending a lot of money on stuff that you don't think is necessarily worthwhile or you don't understand how it's worthwhile just because people have told you, oh, you need to do this to be good, right? This is an essential piece of kit. Now, we have told you what we feel is essential, but we've also told you that you don't need to go and spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on this stuff, but you will meet people in your airsoft career who will tell you, oh, well, I use a real deal this, and it was $900, and that makes me a better a better player on the field. And almost all of the time, that is complete and utter nonsense. And I think, like, you know, to be honest, I've probably been guilty of that accidentally, not in the sense of, like, going, oh, man, like, you should, you have to buy what I'm using, but, like, people have definitely gone, oh, I like your plate kit or your chest rig. Uh, where'd you get it? And I will just tell them what it is and where I got it and then carry on. When often I should really be going like, you don't actually need to spend $300 on this, especially if they're a newer player, right? And the same thing f f goes, you know, we've said this in the podcast a lot of times, like we've made recommendations for the pieces of kit that we think are the best, right? Prometheus Barrels, not a sponsor, right? BTC Spectres, also not a sponsor. Those are expensive pieces of kit. And you should never, ever feel like we are trying to tell you, hey, you need this to be good. The reality is, and I think we've articulated it a few times, you definitely don't need that to be good. You can be good independent of all of this. The only thing we're trying to do, uh, and we've, I think, tried to do over the last you know, several episodes, is to give you a framework that you can work under, right? To say, where am I going to spend my money? Where does it make sense to be, to be spending actual dollars versus just, you know, piddly cash. And we said, if something looks fun to you and you just want to spend money on it because it looks cool, you should definitely do that thing. But when it comes to spending your money on pieces of kit, you should be doing that because you understand what benefit you're going to get from that piece of kit or because you want to. It should never, ever be because you feel pressured by other people to get that stuff to fit in or be good on the field or, or, or some in some way you're going to gain people's respect because when you roll up to the field with this piece of kit, people are going to go, oh, wow, look at what this guy's using. The reality is like when people who have been playing a really long time see people using expensive gear, the only thing that we think is, oh, that guy's got a lot of money. If you, if you don't think it's going to make your game more enjoyable your play more effective uh, or because you know, hey i'll absolutely give this to people if you don't think it's just ooh, shiny don't do it yeah right and don't let people pressure you into into thinking otherwise right but the reality is yeah like you're you're gonna see this at fields you're gonna see all kinds of kit that looks really good and you're gonna have players tell you like pat was saying what they use and you might go oh well if pat uses it i have to use it and you know unless you really feel that don't feel that pressure because fundamentally you know, we are, most of us are not made of money, so you should be trying to see about how you want to spend that money smartly in a way that's actually going to support your play for years and years to come, rather than having to spend it over and over and over because you're just buying crummy stuff that uh, looks cool but doesn't work, uh, or spending oodles of money on stuff just because people tell you to. I hope this has been helpful, right? I hope this has been effective in terms of giving you guys uh, a framework to sort of hang your purchasing plan on, right? Um, you know, we're not here to tell you, oh, you absolutely have to get this specific thing. Um, I mean, if you want us to, we can, <laughs> but that's not the goal. Um, mm -hmm. We just want to give you sort of a starting point so that you're not going out there and looking, you know, Googling, oh, you know, um, plate carrier and seeing, oh man, that's $500. I guess I need a $500 plate carrier or seeing someone who 
you know, plays Airsoft and has reviewed a $500 play carry and is going, this is the best thing ever and it will make you better than God. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. So as Pat said, we hope you found this helpful. Um, but aside from that, we've got nothing else for you. So we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Have a good one.